Greetings, and welcome to this brief introduction to Plato's dialogue, The Euthydemus. The Euthydemus is a comic delight. In it, Socrates' main interlocutors, the brothers Euthydemus and Dionysodorus, prove ridiculous things, such as that it's impossible to lie, that Socrates is omniscient, and that every father, even a dog, is every one's father. As a result, the dialogue is filled with cheering, laughter, and many oaths. All this clowning, though, forces upon us the question, what's serious here? To pursue this answer, let's first consider the dialogue as a whole. It appears to fall into three main parts. First, a brief dramatic dialogue between Socrates and his old friend Crito. Second, Socrates' narration of a conversation he had the day before with Euthydemus and Dionysodorus. And third, a return to the dramatic dialogue between Socrates and Crito. However, the Euthydemus is unique in that the long central narrative is interrupted by an angry outburst from Crito and a return to the dramatic dialogue between him and Socrates. So then, the dialogue actually has five main parts. The opening dramatic dialogue between Crito and Socrates, the first part of Socrates' narration, the return to the dramatic dialogue between Crito and Socrates, the second part of Socrates' narration, and the concluding dramatic dialogue between Crito and Socrates. The unique return to the dramatic dialogue is therefore the central part. Again then, what should we take seriously here? If we look only at the first part of Socrates' narration, the impression is that Plato means to contrast Socrates favorably with the two sophists. Euthydemus and Dionysodorus spin out arguments that deny the possibility of wisdom or of the truth itself. They make not only their own arguments fall down, as Socrates puts it, they make reason itself look absurd. In contrast, in this same section, Socrates leads his pliable young friend Cleinias to agree that to do well, he needs good things, and that the only truly good thing is wisdom. So Socrates looks like the morally serious teacher compared to the frivolous sophists. So far, so good. However, in the central section of the dialogue, where the dramatic conversation between Socrates and Crito returns and takes the place of a crucial dialogue between Socrates and Cleinias, we learn that both Crito and Cleinias fall into aporia, a state of being at a loss, when they try to explain what this wisdom is that is the one thing needful. They agree that this wisdom is the kingly or political art, and that that art makes people good, and that people are good by knowing how to live well. But what that knowledge is, they cannot say. It looks, then, like Socrates can turn others towards virtue, but he cannot deliver the goods. The second part of Socrates' narration, which follows, only makes matters worse. Socrates begs the brothers to reveal the knowledge of living well. In response, what we get is, as one commentator puts it, a prize fight in which the speakers become all the vainer and prouder as the content of the conversation appears to devolve into nonsense. In the last section, we learn that Crito heard from someone else who heard the dialogue that it was mere babble and that it reflected poorly on Socrates to engage in it. Big surprise. Here then we face the real question of the Euthydemus. Why does Socrates take the brothers so seriously? He says he wants to study with them. He asks Crito to join him in that study and to pay for it. He tells Cleinias that the brothers have something altogether beautiful to reveal. He says that he wants to make their wisdom his own. Now, is this merely Socrates' customary irony? If so, why does he risk his reputation this way? Perhaps the answer lies in observing the two characters against whom Socrates defends the brothers, the young man Tisippus and the old man Crito. Now, Tisippus is a lover of Cleinias. As such, he is vehement, passionate, and he swears a lot. Crito is a respectable gentleman who is concerned about the education of his son. As such, he cares about money and reputation. Now, in the face of Tisippus, Socrates defends Euthydemus as a dialectician, a title Socrates elsewhere applies to himself. To Crito, Socrates is even more direct. He says that the brothers belong to the camp of the philosophers. In short, by defending the brothers, Socrates implicitly defends philosophy itself, against a lover on the one hand and a gentleman on the other. 
With the lover, he succeeds, not so much with the gentleman. This relative lack of success would seem to reflect a fundamental antagonism between the philosophy and the city. But how can we take the brothers as philosophic? To answer this question would require examining each of their speeches, with eyes unclouded by admiration or by blame. But consider just a summary of some of their claims. That wisdom is, in a way, impossible. That wisdom is, in another way, universal. That becoming wise means dying. That it is a fine thing to refute others and to refute oneself. That we somehow know all things before we are born. That it may be permissible to beat your father. And that one needs only a few good things. If we find it surprising that Socrates would long for such wisdom, even in his old age, then perhaps we are looking at Socrates too much through the lens of the impassioned lover or of the law-abiding gentleman. Thank you for joining this brief introduction to Plato's dialogue, The Euthydemus.